All right, good morning. Uh, my name is David Akana, and I am the moderator of this morning's On the Record Briefing uh, here at the 15th uh, Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD. Today, we are focusing on science. What about science, you may ask? For today, we shall focus on uh, the uh, science uh, with respect to uh, restoring, uh, uh, rather, with respect to restoration and drought. So, you have been told that one of the solutions to land degradation is restoration. Uh, debated as that may be, uh, but it is obviously offered as one of the solutions. We are also told that containing drought, we have to leverage scientific evidence to be able to do that uh, adequately. And so uh, to discuss that issue, we have invited a set of, uh, we have invited uh, a set of officials. Um, they are eminent scholars in their own right, uh, but volunteering time to help produce a science that enables the UNCCD, government officials, policymakers, businesses, et cetera, et cetera, to take action against land degradation in all its forms. So we shall be having one briefer this morning. Uh, that's Dr. Nicole uh, Berger, uh, who is the co-chair of the Science Policy Interface uh, at the United Nations uh, Convention to Combat Desertification. Dr. Berger is a professor uh, in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado in Boulder in the United States. Berger received a master's degree from the University of California at Berkeley and holds a PhD from Colorado State University. Berger works as an ecologist to support sustainable land management and restoration of broad variety of ecosystems throughout the world. Berger was a coordinating lead author on the IPIS, Global Land Degradation and Restoration Assessment. She's also the research director uh, of uh, uh, Kanye Online's Research Center in South uh, Eastern Utah, that's in the United States. In our research program, Berger works in partnership with diverse government entities in the US on land degradation and restoration issues, such as the ecological or the ecological risk of fire mitigation treatments, historical drivers, and bow uh, uh, chemical responses to woody plant, uh, woody plant encroachment, forest decline and regeneration, and more recently, restoration of degraded dryland ecosystems with a specific focus on soil ecology. Dr. Berger also has extensive research experience working on conservation and management issues in dryland ecosystem across the world. She has worked with international research teams in semi-arid grasslands of Inner Mongolia and anthropo uh, anthropogenic grassland ecosystems of Venezuela, in addition to work in Southern Africa on plant invasion in the biodiversity hotspot of Cape Floristic region of South Africa and vegetation dynamics of the Namib uh, desert, and that's in Namibia. So that's an introduction of our uh, brief for this morning. Uh, just some quick ground rules, just so you're all aware. Keep in mind that you could use the Q&A function to send out your questions. We've realized in the last couple of days that some of you want to use a chat function. Perhaps you're more used to that. But if you can send your questions over in the Q&A function, that would be great. But then that doesn't come until we hear from Dr. Berger. It's also important for me to just say here yeah, that this uh, uh, webinar is recorded so that we can then uh, share with anyone else who's going to have to follow uh, after uh, this event. So with that, I would now turn it over to Dr. Berger. Good morning, Dr. Berger. She's sitting right to my left in the media center here at uh, the UNC City ongoing COP, and that's precisely in Abidjan. Welcome, and thanks for joining us, Dr. Berger. I just noticed that. Great. So we'll give a couple of minutes. Uh, Dr. Berger just got kicked out. She's right there. So everything should work well. Let's see if everything is now working well for Dr. Berger. Uh, she just got kicked out uh, a few minutes ago. So let's see if uh, she is reconnected. Uh, give us just a couple of seconds so we can get this right. Um, may I just say in the meantime that, um, as we indicated, uh, this is gonna last some times between 45 minutes to one hour. And so uh, please um, feel free to listen in and prepare any questions that you may have uh, for our uh, guest this morning. Let's see if Dr. Berger is connected once again. So on my uh, machine, cheese. All right, so maybe we're just gonna move on and use plan B, which is for you to use uh, to address our, our um, journalist directly from my laptop, because I think that would be more helpful, right? Yeah. So you're just sitting next to me. So you just go ahead and uh, uh, probably just speak uh, directly to uh, our reporters. Over to you. 
Thank you, David, and I appreciate that that introduction. And um, so welcome, everyone. I, we're really excited for Science Day tomorrow, as David said. We, I am the science policy, UNCCD science policy interface co-chair, and we will be having a session tomorrow si um, titled Science for Action, Land Restoration, and Drought. So this session will go tomorrow from 8 in the morning here in Cote d'Ivoire to 5 p.m. And we have sessions especially set aside to for press engagement tomorrow. So we're really hoping that you will you know, um, come in and, and see our sessions. So what I'd like to do is really talk about the importance of science to the UNCCD today. So um, what I have served on the science policy in our space now for four years. And this has been an incredible opportunity for me as a scientist because normally I interact with other scientists, graduate students, um, but this has been an incredible opportunity to really engage with policymakers and decision makers. And this is something that we rarely get to do unless we go out and seek those opportunities uh, on our own. But the UNCCD Science Policy Interface, which was formed in 2012, is a really unique opportunity for scientists to be able to look at and evaluate and synthesize science that is relevant, relevant to decision makers. And what's interesting about the Science Policy Interface is that we sit with decision makers in the Science Policy Interface and we are talking to them, They're, they become our colleagues. And we, th what this does is that because, um, as many of you may know, scientists, or maybe you don't know, so maybe this is a secret, but scientists tend to go down rabbit holes. We get really interested in things and we go, go chase them. But when we're sitting right there with other decision makers and policy makers, and they're saying, well, why is this relevant? And it really brings us back into, you know, asking the question, you know, what, what, what we are working on and why is it relevant and just keeping us on track. So that's been really important for our process. So going to our session, uh, our sessions today and or tomorrow on Saturday and how it is structured, the title is, again, Land Restoration and Drought. So the morning session will really focus on land restoration. And why that's important is that more than 70% of the Earth's ice-free terrestrial systems have been transformed from their natural states. Countries have reported that one-fifth of all land is now degraded, affecting the human be uh, well-being of over um, 3 billion people globally. And this, these impacts don't occur um, randomly. There are specific people that live in marginalized communities that are most um, that are most impacted. So, avoiding reducing land re land degradation and restoring degraded lands frame the process for achieving what is the, the central goal in UC UNCCD in terms of the sustainable development goals of land degradation and neutrality. So maintaining the vitality of land is of crucial importance for environmental, social, and economic targets at local and global scales. And the achievement of the sustainable development goals will not be possible without this focus on healthy land. So this first session tomorrow on land restoration is also a celebration of the launch of the UN Decade of Restoration which aims to prevent, halt, and reverse the degradation of ecosystems on every continent and in every ocean and provides this central rallying call for the protection and revival of ecosystems around the world. However, as the global environmental crisis unfolds, simplistic solutions and grand projects increasingly attract the attention of people, governments, leaders, and donors and, and so we really want to focus tomorrow on what is the science that can support us in decision making. And so restoring degraded lands at scale has become the focus of many of these initiatives. 
And so what I would like to highlight for many of you on this call today are some of the regionally important talks that presentations and topics that we'll be discussing. discussing. So one topic will be re restoration of degraded cocoa landscapes in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, another is farmers are regreening African drylands. How socially and ecologically sustainable is the functional diversity of, of these trees that are regenerating? Uh, another talk that we'll be given is monitoring tree cover across Africa's Great Green Wall and challenges, um, looking at some of those challenges and opportunities with the Great Green Wall. And I think most exciting uh, in this early, this land rest restoration session in the morning is the one hour session really focused on youth and on the African continent, youth and the future of youth is critically important to the social, economic, and um, environmental success of the continent. And so we will be hearing from graduate students and some of the, the next generation voices in conservation and sustainable development. So in our second session in the afternoon, we'll be focusing on drought. And the, the main reason that we're focusing on drought is that we have are also coming off of a major report that we have coming out from the science policy interface on drought resilience and the effects on ecosystems and people. And the importance of droughts is that they are the most costly and complex natural hazards. They have deep and widespread impacts in society, ecosystems, and economies. And their indirect and direct costs of droughts are often distributed similar to land degradation unevenly with the heaviest load borne by the most vulnerable people. And we see that in, at, at across the continent and across the world on how people in, on, that live in vulnerable populations and marginalized populations are impacted by drought. So in addition to climate variability, so we're in thinking about the future of climate change and climate variability, climate change is increasing temperatures and intensifying the rainfall patterns, which in turn will likely increase the intensity, frequency, and duration of droughts in many regions of the world. And an urgent shift is needed in the management of droughts, moving from this reactive crisis management that we currently have in place in most regions around the world to proactive drought risk management. And that has been a real focus for many agencies and partnerships with the UNCCD, which include the World Meteorological Organization, Global Water Par Partnership, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and many other organizations are intensely working and supporting countries to develop proactive drought management policies. So in this context, the SPI provides scientific knowledge, and this is the important part, the science policy interface and the celebration of science day tomorrow provides the scientific knowledge in co combination with the guidance on the policy situations to develop um, more proactive drought management and land deg degradation policies. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions from the audience. Excellent, great. So I'm just gonna keep this close to you and I, uh, uh, Dr. Burgess, so we don't have to move uh, our, uh, our computers, uh, you know, uh, back and forth. Uh, so, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear participants, for those of you who might have just joined us right now, uh, we are actually uh, having this briefing from Abidjan uh, at the uh, United Nations uh, Convention to Combat Desertification, uh, the 15th Conference of the Parties. So you had Dr. Berger uh, about the criticality of science to this process, and we're talking about two issues here, restoration and drought. And tomorrow, Saturday, which is uh, May 14th, it's going to be uh, Science Day year, and so the focus is going to be really how you can use and leverage science to be able to have better policies. And you've had Dr. Berger speak to the fact that we have to change the approach moving from a crisis management sort of approach to probably a more proactive, you know, uh, management of uh, droughts and other crises that, you know, other 
um, uh, uh, crisis that we might be having at this point or hazards that we might be having at this point uh, across the world. So you've had, uh, let's see if we have a few questions that we can start taking the questions right away. So there is an anonymous uh, attendee who is, uh, and would like your name. I think it also has to have your name because we can address you directly. And if there's anything that is specific to your region, uh, it helps uh, narrow the discussion to, to your country as well or your region. So can you tell us more about the report you mentioned, uh, Dr. Badger? Do you want to go ahead? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. So we have two reports coming up from the science policy interface. One group of our, one group of the SPI, we're going to use an acronym now, has focused- the science policy interface. At the science policy in, in, interface. Right focused on integrated land use planning and integrated land use management to as a way to achieve land degradation neutrality. And that is a report that now has an advanced copy that we would be able to provide links to after this meeting. And the second, um, the, the second report is on drought resilience and looking at drought resilience in re of ecosystems and people and looking at human well-being and, and trying to understand, you know, can we measure, can we monitor the resilience, which is the, the, the ability of people and ecosystems to be hit by a drought and then be able to respond and bounce back. How resilient are people and ecosystems to drought? And so that report is currently being edited and will be forthcoming. Well, with hopes within a few weeks after the conference of parties. Okay, so uh, the expectation is that it's going to be published soon after the UNCCD conference. Yes, it will be published after the UNCCD conference. It will be available on the UNCCD website. Okay. Yes. Great, excellent. So uh, we would obviously share that as soon as we get all the information. So Busani Bafana. He's a journalist, several years of experience working out of Zimbabwe, uh, and he is very active on these issues, uh, a science reporter himself. So uh, Bafani's question, oh, sorry, Bafana's question is, the science is clear that climate change is real and the certification is on the march, to use his words. Are policymakers listening to the science, given the poor response uh, to action? Great question, I think. That is a really great question. and. I feel like in the time that I have been working in the science policy arena, and that has been eight years now, that I've seen an incredible shift in the awareness of land degradation and issues like drought. And this has been incredibly hopeful and heartening to me as a scientist, that we feel like that we're being heard now and the work that we're doing is being taken up and taken seriously. And so I think what I see is the next opportunity is educating the public. And that's where all of you as journalists come in, is getting the information out there because we do have the ear of the policymakers now. They are understanding that we need to act immediately. We, from so many of these issues, we have less than a decade to now to respond. And so we really need the general public to understand this. And again, I can't emphasize the importance of getting this information out to the general public. And so, for example, I teach, and I think it's also important to educate our public, our um, youth, and the next generation uh, who will be taking, um, taking the reins of leadership. Uh, Bafana, feel free, uh, please feel free to, uh, if you have any follow-up, obviously the question remains, and I, I definitely hear you, Nicole. Um, I think it's a relevant question, uh, and having, um, you know, obviously uh, had this same question being asked in my first COP uh, back in 2005 in Montreal, Canada, and that is being asked again today, obviously demonstrate that there could be a gulf between the availability of science and policies. Um, and the uptake of the evidence. Uh, and I think that's what this question speaks to. Um, I guess uh, your answer is you see an incredible shift. Uh, you think you're being heard more. Uh, that's what you're saying, yes, right? Yes. Exactly. Great. So let's see what other questions we have. Uh, so, um, um, so what information do you have 
uh, for journalists wanting to report uh, or attend press briefings on Science Day tomorrow. That's uh, uh, for tomorrow, yeah. So I think the first place to go would be to the Rio Pavilion website. So we have our full list of talk titles and the run of show for tomorrow. So I think that would be the, the most important thing to go to. Uh, the other thing that we could share is our report uh, or our, our science communication that is coming out of the SPI. What we have in advanced copy would be the second uh, item that we could share with you. But I think the most important thing is just show up tomorrow because that will be you know, I, I know many of you are not going to want to sit down tonight and write, um, read a technical report. So what these opportunities give us, like Science Day, is to showcase the science and that you get this in a very short time commitment in a number of talks with a lot cycling through a lot of people that are experts in this area. So I would say the, the, the best thing is to prioritize uh, attending tomorrow. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go over to Liberia and uh, get a question from Evelyn. Evelyn uh, works for uh, the local media and reports for Dutch Bella as well. And her question here is, how do you get countries using in the case of Liberia, for instance, to restore uh, lands that have been degraded as a result of mining activities? Thank you, Evelyn. This is a really great question and actually something that I work on as a scientist. I, I don't work specifically on mining, but I do work on a broad range of restoration approaches in restoring degraded lands. And I would have to say that the mining activities are incredibly challenging because oftentimes with mining, we have removed all, uh, all possibilities of restoration from you know, the, the native plant seeds that are in the soil are often gone, the soil organic matter that would provide the nutrients to support any um, plant communities are also either gone or highly depleted. And so the restoration of mining activities takes a, a lot more effort. And what we see is that we need additions of, of soil organic matter. There are, I, I think the most hopeful thing is that there are a range of technologies now, such as um, seed technologies that if you were to throw out a bunch of seeds onto a, a highly degraded mining landscape, it's unlikely that they're going to be successful. But there are technologies coming out now that take those seeds and put them into a nice pocket of um, nutrients and um, to, to be able, that they will able to be able to establish in their own little, um, they, they call them seed technology pucks and that they, you put them in with their own little home in order to be, um, be, be able to um, establish on these highly degraded landscapes. So I, my short answer is, after that long answer, was that, is that there's a lot of technologies coming out now to help restore highly degraded lands due to mining activities. Excellent, great. And I think that's something that uh, would encourage Evelyn to want to uh, maybe uh, dig deeper in part because uh, it's important to say that it's just quite immense, well, I'd say huge innovations out there that, you know, could be used. Um, and in this case, uh, it's, it is through mining, it is through Liberia, it is through several other countries, African countries where there's a lot of mining activity. So I think that's that's a very important question. And thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Berger, for that answer. So Paul, it's from um, uh, uh, Kenya, uh, and uh, he's focused on young, young, young scientists. And the question here is that, is there any form in which you're engaging, are you engaging African uh, uh, scientists, uh, young scientists who are part of African universities on some of these issues? Are they part of the science policy interface, just, just to put it that way? So we do have, that, I'll take that first question, are they part of the science policy interface? So one of the most exciting programs that we launched in the last two years on the science policy interface is the Early Career Scientist Program. So what we are doing is targeting uh, scientists. But, so many of us are getting old, are in mid, mid or late career. And so we are targeting those early career scientists just out of graduate school, a few years, 
that are just launching their careers, that are highly motivated, who have been trained, especially this is critically important, they are, who are, uh, are trained in sustainable development issues. And so we've launched this program. We have now two seats on the science policy interface for the early career scientists. This last round as a pilot program, we had two highly talented female um, African scientists who served on the science policy interface. And if any of you would like to talk with them, they would, um, they would both be available um, to be able to do any press interviews. And the other thing that we're doing here at the Conference of Parties is reaching out on Science Day to the Youth Forum here. So we have a, a, one of our science policy interface members who, who is liaison with the Youth Forum and we're, we're de developing statements from them. We are hoping that they will be in the room tomorrow and engaging with them on these issues. Excellent, thank you. Uh, David Kazi is from Mauritius, uh, working for the Mauritius Broadcasting uh, Network. And his question is, uh, there are many governments and policymakers uh, who commit themselves to take action regarding environmental issues. Do you consider that science specialists uh, or the opinion of science scientists are always considered during this decision uh, making process? Uh, why every often, whereas very often political considerations affect policies being implemented? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And in the time that I have been working with decision makers, my view of this has changed. And I think this is a question I get all of the time. So when I originally started working with decision makers, I would come into the room and I would feel like I'm the scientist, listen to me now. And that's really not how it works. I, I see myself now as a scientist, as a stakeholder in this process, because I have one view of the world. I have a scientific view, view of the world. And I would even say I have a Western scientific view of the world. There are other knowledge systems that we are acknowledging now, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge. And so what I view myself as is that I can bring my best science to the process. However, decision makers have the, the most challenging job in the world because they are taking into um, consideration not only science, but the social, um, economic, institutional frameworks in which they work. And so what I try to do as a scientist is bring my best science and look at the challenges they have and help them in, in, in integrating that science into the decisions that they're making and decreasing the insert, using science to decrease their uncertainty when they do make decisions. Talk a little bit about this indigenous. Would you want to speak a little bit more about that? This indigenous uh, uh, knowledge uh, systems that you just talked about, and how you are actually leveraging that on the African continent in your work. In in my in the science policy interface yes, work. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm I'm going to take a minute to just think about that because in our last work program on the science policy interface. We have not directly addressed indigenous knowledge systems or, or been able to bring that into our work. And the challenge is, is that, you know, in Western science, we can go to Google and pull up research papers and read them. And, and so the engagement with indigenous communities needs much more development of partnerships, of being in the room, asking questions and gathering information in a, a different way than we are used to. And I, I think that has been, so I, I think the first step is awareness of bringing in indigenous and local knowledge. And our, our, our next step is to try to understand how we, we integrate that into our work. And I, again, I, I think it's, it's a, a challenge in doing that because it, do, it requires relationships and partnerships and, uh, and people being in the room. That's a very good question. Excellent, great. So um, there is Sylvie uh, who uh, works for the Cameroon Radio and Television Corporation. She's based in Cameroon. Uh, she wants to, uh, you to maybe speak a little bit uh, about an issue you raised earlier on about the contribution of farmers in regaining uh, uh, Africa's dry land. So 
she says it's a laudable thing, uh, and uh, if that is being done, uh, but despite the restoration efforts of our soil, uh, rather our soils are still losing their nutrients due to land degradation, influx of chemical use on, uh, on, on farms, uh, which poses a threat to health. So what advice would you want to have to farmers as they combat land desertification and ensuring healthy soils for better productivity? I think that's also a really great question. And I think the advice for farmers is that your land is always a local, con like this local context. And you're always looking at, so your farm in one area might be, and, and, and the actions that you take might be very different than even someone five kilometers, 10 kilometers away. And so I would say that the, the best um, strategies and approaches for farmers is to have people on the ground who are, who have knowledge to be able to go to a farm and say, I see that you've lost the soil organic matter. Um, I know from this app that we have that the potential for this land is that you should be able to grow an incredible great um, crop here. However, you've had these losses and what we can do now is put manure on the field. We can put in um, obstructions into the um, landscape to decrease wind erosion and water erosion. And so it's having those people on the ground in communities educating people who, who have agricultural backgrounds that can educate people on what they can do when their lands get to that point and so i think that would be the most important thing or you know any way that we can get information to farmers that is simple cost effective and and proven scientifically proven to work is the best thing that we can do um, there is Jubel from uh, Zambia. She has she raised her hand, but Jubel, allow me just to say that um, we, the way the webinar is set up, you may not be able to speak. I know you are actually uh, a, um, a radio journalist, so obviously uh, it would have been great to hear your voice, but this is set up in a way that you cannot directly uh, ask your question. So shall I suggest that you send your question over uh, to the Q&A function so that our guests here this morning, our briefer this morning can answer uh, you. Uh, if you may do that, uh, that would be great. So we are almost getting to the end of this press briefing. Uh, a couple more points from our side. Uh, doctor, would you just want to tell us a little bit, so far, what would be your overall uh, assessment of the progress that we've made with respect to restoring uh, with, with the overall process of restoration up until this point? I would say and what work is left to be done. I, I think we have a tremendous amount of work to be done. And I feel like we are at the beginning of our restoration efforts. And so I, I, I can't emphasize enough that we are at the beginning of our, of our efforts. We have to act now and that it's going to be a tremendous amount of work. However, what I am seeing is that the, the commitments from the private sector from governments to move us forward more quickly is, is incredibly hopeful. And I think that's a hopeful message that we should be sending is that we, we have an opportunity over the next few years to really move the dial on land restoration. And we have a globally engaged youth that I hear every day from youth. How can I get involved? How can I, you know, how can I have an impact? And I tell them, we are, we are seeing incredible amounts of funding. We are seeing jobs in renewable energy. We are seeing jobs in, in, in restoration. And, that, and we are seeing jobs in how do we, um, you know, deal with the effects of climate change. And so I think that is the most important thing is that we need to act now. We, um, we have, a, we're generating the will by the decision makers, and we need to generate the, the, the will in the general public across the world. What specifically is expected from the private sector and businesses? I, I, I mean, the, the main thing is the, the financing, is okay. that when you look at these large expanses of degraded land, how do we get communities involved in, in the planning process? And 
and having then once they do the planning and once they big and, and and built partnerships how do they have the financing to be able to um, impl implement those plans excellent great so um uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Sylvie. Uh, she, she is appreciative of uh, your answer with respect to her question. Uh, Sylvie is uh, really focused on, um, she's on the ground uh, in Cameroon and focusing on uh, the issues in, in, our, in, our, in, in our home country. So thank you so much. So I uh, would suggest that uh, in the absence of any other question, uh, let's see if we can get some final thoughts from our briefer uh, because um, uh, you have spoken at length uh, about uh, a whole host of issues this morning, uh, primarily focusing a little bit more about uh, the uh, uh, Science Day, which is coming up tomorrow. Uh, but let's take this few last question. Uh, probably there's one more we would do, we'll take that, and then we would go ahead and get the final thoughts of our briefer and then close. And so Paul is asking, can we have the profile and contacts of the two female scientists mentioned who are part of the early career science science uh, scientist uh, program? Yes, we'd be happy to follow up with that, and I'm I'm sure they would both be happy to talk with any of you. Great. And in the meantime, I'm also going to ask maybe uh, Dr. Berger to just probably drop you know if that is okay with you uh, your contacts because journalists might want to follow up with you soon after that, uh, so we can actually send that over to you. Great. Yes. So we are pretty much uh, at the end of this briefing, which I thought was very productive, in part because of the criticality of science to these whole processes. It's not, it's just one of them, but it's also a very critical one in the sense that I don't see how we succeed without using science, because this is primarily science driven. Uh, so I totally agree with you that it is a critical component. It's not all of it. Unfortunately, some of the determination usually it's political, it's uh, social. And so there's always that tension. And I know you have plenty of work to educate not only the public, but also the policymakers to be able to, you know, take, you know, take up this scientific evidence in policy making. What are your final thoughts? If you would want to reflect about that, maybe you would focus on the day that you're organizing tomorrow, which is Science Day year at the conference of the parties. And any other final thoughts that you might want to have with respect to restoration, drought, and science and livelihoods in Africa as it relates to some of the participants that we have this morning. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to make a final statement. And I, I first want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing, that you're here today and that you're listening to us have this conversation because I do think that some, the, this is an incredible amount of work and important work that you're all doing as journalists. So my, my final thoughts are that, um, you know, we are, as scientists, we are trying to affect change in the decision making and, and, and really be at, available to decision makers all the time now in, in terms of being able to answer questions about what is happening with the land, what is happening with drought, what is happening with climate change. And I, I think this is important because many of us now are seeing the detrimental effects of all of these processes across the world and engaging in a very different way than we may have been a generation ago as scientists. So in terms of our goals for land degradation and restoration, we have an incredibly ambitious goals. And the, the most important thing is that if we are successful in achieving these ambitious land re restoration goals over the UN decade of restoration, we are going to positively affect the lives of billions of people. This is not just about land. So I think that is probably my most important um, communication here is that this is not just about land. This is about people and their livelihoods. And so with that, I think that I would like to end there. Excellent. Great. Please, journalists, feel free to join tomorrow at the uh, uh, Science Day. Join, join tomorrow. We'll send out a link, and I think you might have had it already. 
With that, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you so much for those who took time off to participate in this morning's briefing. Hope you found that useful and that that could trigger some stories for your local publications. It's important that we continue to write about this issue so that you know we can uh, get as many people to have an understanding about these issues and raise the visibility on these issues as well. And in this morning's uh, version, we were talking about uh, science. With that, we want to thank you so much and see you tomorrow, same time, nine o'clock uh, Abidjan time, which is GMT plus zero. Thank you. Bye-bye.